Our first speaker is Dr. Steve Axelrod from the Boswell Group. Uh, Henry Schein has worked with the Boswell Group over the years. They do wonderful work. And uh, Dr. Axelrod is someone who is an expert on motivating teams. And he's going to speak today to how to motivate teams, particularly in the wake of a crisis uh, such as the one we are all experiencing. So without further ado, Dr. Steve Axelrod. Thanks, Gerard. And thanks for inviting me here today. Uh, especially because although I do a lot of work with teams, uh, I am not a public speaker. Uh, but under the circumstances, being asked to talk on this particular topic, I really couldn't say no. Uh, my work is really focused on the intersection between individual psychology and business and organizational life. So this is, this is the area that I've committed to. It's my mission to make life better at the intersection of the individual and the organization. So I've had some experience in this regard. I want to share some of my thoughts, even though I'm not a public speaker by nature. Um, I want to help you think about the context that you're working in. These are extremely difficult and challenging circumstances. I'm not making light of the difficulties and uh, the pain and the suffering that you and other people have gone through. Uh, but I do want to drive home, uh, if there's only one point today, this particular point, which is uh, I've been in this field for a number of decades at this point, and I can say to you, and you probably know from your own experience, that uh, adversity, setback, loss, often is the key to human growth and positive change. So if we look in the long run at events like this hurricane, we see people over time finding resources in themselves to not only cope, but maybe reorder their lives, redirect their work uh, in a positive direction. So, it's difficult in some ways to bring that message to people in the midst of a trauma, uh, but it's a perspective that I want you to try to keep in mind as I challenge you to think about your own resilience. If we think about the key to thriving under adversity, we get to the concept of resilience, and today I want to look inside the black box of resilience with you to talk a little bit about the key elements of personal resilience and resilient leadership. Now you might say that resilience is something you're born with or it's something that you either have or you don't have. Uh, two things to keep in mind. We can't really predict who's going to be resilient under adverse circumstances. Uh, it's always interesting to see who finds what in themselves and how they thrive over time. That's number one. Number two, there are some elements of resilience that can be learned. So I'm going to give you some tips, some pointers, uh, for how to think about building your own personal resilience, and that's the foundation uh, for your resilience as a leader. So first things first. Definitions. Uh, the definition of trauma is going to be no surprise to you, right? It's an extraordinary circumstance like we've just been through. A natural disaster is the archetypal traumatic event, right? It's a perceived threat to physical integrity, which causes marked distress and overwhelms the ability to cope. Vulnerability and loss of control are the key concepts here, the key aspects of experience. And I think we've all felt that, although to varying degrees under the present circumstances. And I think you, you know there's a lot of variability in what people have experienced as a result of Hurricane Sandy, and that, of course, we can get into. But uh, the perceived threat to physical integrity, some people more than others. But if it's not physical integrity, it's your 
your lifeblood, you know, your, your living, making a living. Resilience is the ability to be robust under conditions of stress. Very simply, what's resilience? It's the ability to bounce back, right? It's the rubber band thing, you know, the rubber band stretches but doesn't break. The twig snaps, right? But what makes for the ability to bounce back? What makes the rubber band able to stretch and, and come back? So here are five keys to personal resilience as I see it. Number one, and this may, this may surprise you, uh, number one is, is to be self-aware. Well, what do I mean by that? Understand, accept, acknowledge how this thing or any other stressful event, because we're talking about stressful events, not just traumas, how it affects you. You've got to be able to take an inventory of your physical, emotional, cognitive, well-being. And you folks are probably good at that. You know, you're good at doing assessments. You're good at stepping back, you know, really taking an inventory. But now you've got to do it with yourself. Because if you don't, and you indulge in denial, you're at risk for stress reactions. Denial is a risk factor. And we like to think, oh, well, you know, we just soldier on, we do fine, blah, 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 blah. You got to be able to look in the mirror and evaluate. Are you having trouble sleeping? Are you having trouble, are you, have you lost your appetite? Do you have headaches? Do you have GI symptoms? Are you having difficulty focusing and concentrating? That's a big one. Nightmares? Perceived memory loss, you're probably not actually losing your memory, but you may feel like you are. And then the whole panoply of emotional reactions. Anger, rage, I think more likely anxiety, guilt, emotional ups and downs, irritability, that's a big one. Uh, increased drug and alcohol use, also common. Withdrawal. Social withdrawal is a big aspect of this, and I'll come back to it. So if you have trouble taking a look in the mirror, maybe you know somebody who can hold up the mirror to you in a friendly way, hopefully, and tell you, you know, you're just not the same. You got to, and here we go to the next topic, take care of yourself. Self-care after self-aware, they're twinned up together. I think the challenge of folks like yourself in particular, you tend to be caretakers in one way or another. Well, you have to take care of yourselves under these circumstances. So you have to balance your ordinary need to assume control with people who feel vulnerable and helpless with your own need to look at your own vulnerability and helplessness. That's part of the reaction to these kinds of traumatic events. So you have to be able to look at that and acknowledge it. Then you do something about it. You should have a plan for self-care, whether that means you got to really put your eating and sleeping on track, or whether it means that you can't have to really not work 24-7 to get the practice up and running. You have to take some time out. You have to find some way to relax. You have to not totally absent yourself from other relationships, family relationships in particular, and try to balance the hard work of getting things going again with all your other aspects of identity in yourself. Now we get to the cognitive element of this, the beliefs and the attitudes that are keys to personal resilience. I've already hinted at the belief part of it. And the belief part is a worldview that says, uh, if you face adversity, if you have setbacks, that can be an opportunity for growth. You probably can cite examples in your own lives, but you need to start telling yourself that. That needs to be your inner narrative and draw on your own experiences. 
It's very interesting. When I work with executives, uh, sometimes I uh, work with them in a group and ask them questions like, what's made you the person you are today? And you can go around the circle of a bunch of senior global executives, and almost to a person, they'll talk about some loss, some setback, something bad that happened. You, these are high achieving people. You're not hearing about their achievements and their successes, believe me. The shaping, defining events for many people uh, are those times that they faced adversity or experienced a terrible loss. That's really important to keep in mind. Look, I think we all have examples. I've certainly worked with a number of different clients who have been fired from jobs, and they use that opportunity to start the business that they always wanted to start. It sounds hokey, but it's really true. Uh, that people use those setbacks as opportunities to reinvent themselves and restart their lives or bring things into better alignment with who they are and what their values are. So, the takeaways in, in terms of that, I think, uh, should be to keep in mind that your self-worth doesn't depend on specific events and outcomes. Adversity is part of life. It's not going to last forever. It seems like a t catastrophe, and it is in some ways, uh, but it doesn't last forever and it can be a source of change and growth. And furthermore, facing danger and taking risks is a part of life and a part of positive change. Now, how it works that all this adversity, these setbacks lead to growth, that's something I'm not gonna get into here today. We don't have time. I've got lots of thoughts about it. I can you know, articulate it, conceptualize it. For now, we have to just leave it at that I've looked inside that particular black box. It's pretty interesting, but I want to move on to the, the attitude part of it. Uh, the three C's are uh, 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 kind of well-known aspects of uh, uh, mastery and control theory, uh, commitment, control, and challenge. Well, what we're thinking about in terms of building resilience in times like this are it, commitment's the opposite of withdrawal. Commitment is taking meaningful action and committing to a course of action as a critical part of recovery. Now, control doesn't mean that you control everything. I think what's critical at times like this is to know what you can control and what you can't control. You've obviously, we've all had a huge lesson in not being able to control huge waves of uh, walls of water coming at us. We have to think long term about what we can do about that, but there are things we can't control and there are aspects of uh, what you have to do in recovering that you don't have that much control over, but there are things that you do and that's where you focus your energy. And challenge, set yourself the right challenge, an achievable challenge, stretch goals, but not impossible goals. You need to be monitoring yourself for that. Am I setting myself unrealistic goals about what I can do and when I can do it? Finally, and I think the most important aspect of personal resilience is the social network. And I don't mean going out to see the movie about Facebook. I'm talking about social support and drawing on your network of social support at a time like this is absolutely critical. As the AT&T uh, commercial used to say, reach out and touch someone. Help them. I think for this group in particular, it's just as important to ask for help. I got a lesson in the importance of uh, the social network, social support, during the storm and its aftermath. Yeah, I live in Brooklyn, and we were high and dry and uh, didn't lose power. We were very, very fortunate. My wife's elderly parents on Long Island lost power for the better part of two weeks. 
And as the temperature started going down, it became clear that they should come in and stay with us. It was the right thing to do. We were glad to offer. We expected them to accept. They did. Now, was I really looking forward to my in-laws staying with me for six or seven days? I was, had some trepidation. But it was the right thing to do. That six days was really interesting. It was a real bonding experience for us in a way that when we live our individual lives and we're very atomized in this society, we live separately, you know, it's, that's all good in a lot of ways. This was like a little commune, you know? And at the end, of, they'd be there at the beginning of the day, they'd be there at the end of the day, we'd talk about what we did during the day, shared things. I've known them for 15 years. I got closer to them in a positive way in that six or seven days and uh, than I had in those 15 years. A and it was, it was actually, you know, my wife and I looked at each other when they left and said, that was much better than we thought it was going to be. <laughs> you know, they're really not so bad. <laughs> so it, it, I, think it, I, I think it changed our perceptions of each other and I think it was a long-term positive and frankly wouldn't have been expected. So, uh, you know, there's the, social, the social support uh, is a key, I think, to uh, long-term thriving. It's related to longevity, according to some studies, uh, to better health outcomes. So maximizing your social support at times like this are, is critical. So let's move on to your role as leaders and managers. How, how many people here are practice owners, practice leaders? Is that what most of you are? Managers in some way? It, you're probably, if you're a practice leader or owner, you're a manager, right? So what can you do to be more resilient as a leader? Well, first of all, do all the things we just talked about uh, because you're a business person, you're a leader, but you're a person, first of all. And this, this kind of event is about the common denominator, really, first and foremost. So it's, uh, you know, take care of yourself, look inside the black box, try to build your own personal resilience. Now, build on that as a leader. Well, what's the first thing a leader does? In good times, but especially in bad times like this, is communicate. Communicate, 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 as we say. Communicate with everybody. The people who work with you especially, your clients, your patients, your colleagues. Uh, I, a day or two after the storm, I've got a client. He's not a particularly good communicator. He's one of the most elusive people I, I know. You know, he doesn't return calls. He's hard to get to. He pings me by email two days afterwards, how are you, what was the effect, how are you doing? And that kind of thing meant a lot to me. And I think it means a lot. Don't underestimate that power of communicating, just even if it's just asking how people are doing and letting them know how you're doing. Beyond that, keeping people abreast of your plans. People want to know. Your patients and your clients want to know when you're coming back, how you're coming back. Don't overpromise them, but keep them informed. Ask them for suggestions, the people who work for you in particular. Let them know what you expect of them, but take their advice also and their input. When I say model the way, it refers back to what I said a minute ago. Your own model of resilience is something that people are looking at. Don't be afraid to share it. Let people know what you've gone through, how you're coping, how you're trying to think about things, how you're taking care of yourself. I think these times call for a little bit more openness, a little bit more intimacy, a little bit more accessibility than those of us who are trained as 
formal professionals uh, might typically be comfortable with. And I think relaxing those boundaries is good for everybody. I think people need that personal touch. How do you rally your team? How do you get people focused again on working together? How do you get people maybe to pick up the load that other people can't carry? You have to build team morale by focusing on the challenge that you're sharing together, the purpose and the meaning of what you do, because it's, you know, in a lot of ways, what gives people satisfaction at work doesn't, you know, it's related to the money, but beyond that, I think more importantly to a lot of people, it's the sense of meaning and personal in involvement in the mission of the organization, the group, the team, et cetera. People want to be part of something, even if it's hard, especially if it's hard. If it's got, you know, if it's got meaning, if it's got value, if it's got purpose, like getting back, serving your patients, serving your community, people will rally to that. So don't be afraid to challenge them. It's hard. You shouldn't be carrying it alone. If you ask your team to carry the burden with you, if it's made positive and meaningful for them, you'd be surprised at how much people are going to rally to your side. But the meaning and the challenge are critical. So when they do that, recognize and reward them, focus on their strengths. You may find opportunities, or your people may find opportunities, to do things that they've never done before, to try things they've been afraid to try, to fill a role that you know, maybe they didn't think they could fill. Well, that person who was filling that role is not able to come in right now, so maybe they should try it. And that will be part of their resilience, their growth. Recognize it, acknowledge it. Finally, and I think here, plan and decide is what you've been talking about all morning. You know, you're making a plan. Uh, I was talking to a, a gentleman at lunch, and he was talking about his long-term plan for his practice. He's just got his practice up and running again. Um, but he's got to think long-term about the viability of practicing where he's practicing, having the kind of practice that draws on the population it draws on, it's great to serve your community, but what happens when your community is changing, is traumatized, is no longer? This will, you know, make you think about your long-term plan. It gives you an opportunity to plan differently, to think differently. You might not want to just rebuild it the way it had been. You got to be thoughtful about it, but nobody says you have to do exactly the same thing you were doing. So you can think about your vision for the future and take some steps toward implementing it. That will feel, that will give you a sense of personal mastery and effectiveness. So on that note of uh, vision and thinking about your future, let me stop and uh, take some questions if you have them. With respect to the uh uh, recognition and rewarding of your staff and um, and and it's a hardship let it you know it doesn't even need to be said it's a hardship on everyone and those of us who have staff members uh, uh, that are dedicated to the staff we're dedicated to them so at least from my perspective or from my personal situation you have staff members uh, uh, practitioners who uh, you've had to lay some people off um, practitioners who have a five-day work week are now cut to a four-day work week with a 20% pay cut till you're back up and running. And they, they join in and they rally around you and they come up with ideas. And when you implement the ideas that they bring to the table and then there's passive aggression and the plan falls apart, how does one not react without rage and disappointment? 
because here you are implement, letting them take empowerment, but then they have undermined themselves. Well, you asked basically how you cannot be angry and resentful. You are angry and resentful. So you can't cancel it out. You can't take an eraser and not feel that way. Uh, your job uh, as a manager is to kind of tolerate your own anger and resentment, right? And not, and not try to deny it. Again, back, back to the self-aware and self-care. Not try to deny it, but try to work with it, right? Uh, uh, we're often let down by our employees because they don't appreciate what we're doing. They kind of take it for granted. That comes with the territory, and it happens during these times, even though we have the romantic idea that everybody rallies around each other. Doesn't always work that way. However, here's where the communication becomes critically important. Do you pull people together and go over what's going on? That ideas were solicited, suggestions were made, they seemed good, something's happening in terms of the execution, the implementation. Okay, guys, let's try to think through what the obstacles are. What are the barriers? You know, if I were to, in some cases, right, uh, if you asked me this question after 9-11, because I worked with a few organizations after 9-11, I would say, you know, you really should think about the possibility that people are depressed, withdrawn, angry, preoccupied, blah, 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 and that's why they're not implementing. I'm not sure it's relevant in this case, but it's always good to kind of keep your mind open as to what the barriers are. That's what a manager does. You know, we don't give, we're not so good at giving orders and having people follow them anymore. That's not how organizations work like they did 50 years ago. It doesn't work that way. So then we have to become expert diagnosticians. What's, what's the resistance? What are the barriers? Is it personal? Is it one person kind of infecting the whole team? Is it a team dynamic that hasn't come in? Is it that people are way ahead of themselves in terms of what they think they should be able to do but really just can't implement? Don't know. That's but it's you have to start the inquiry process. I think. Uh, what are, uh, uh, you know, people you mentioned on denial. The reactions of many people is going to be that way with all the symptoms that come with it. And so does it imply that the patient has the persons have PTSD and uh, maybe they're going to need. Appropriate treatment. Well, it, it's certainly a place you would start to look. If if people if if you're uh, getting a lot of denial, a lot of young people who are omnipotent who thinks it's not going to affect them or it won't affect them. Um, that's right. You keep your eyes and ears open, like any good clinician, about uh, maybe there are going to be PTSD symptoms down the road. Absolutely. Hi. Hi. That's perfect because I was just about to ask that question. Would you speak a little bit about the signs of PTSD or whatever they're calling it now? Because I've been working in disaster response for a long time. I know how it impacts me just being a responder, but what about the folks that are impacted as well? Could you speak a little bit about just the signs and signals of PTSD? Well. That, that, has, that has a lot to, you know, there's a lot of variability in how it presents, right? And uh, nightmares and flashbacks are, are very common uh, parts of it, but people won't necessarily tell you about that. My experience in this kind of thing is that what people will tell you about is that they're having trouble sleeping. Or they won't tell you a darn thing and they'll withdraw. Then, the art of it is to try to find out if they're reliving something, if they're having some symptoms of that. But that's, not, that's usually not what someone's going to come right out and say, you know, I'm having flashbacks and I'm re-experiencing. This kind of thing is the kind of thing that makes people re-experience 9-11 and aspects of it. 
right? There's a direct, there's a link in the psyche. And these are, you know, oftentimes either more directly impacted people or more vulnerable people, one or the other. Um, but it, they won't necessarily tell you, it's, it's that checklist that I kind of read off at the beginning, that kind of gives you some overall assessment. And then you need to do some inquiry if, if that's your role as to whether there's actual reliving of the trauma. You're welcome. Thanks for asking me.